Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for this evening's session. Uh, the title of the session is Upgrading Your Flagship Portfolios with the Mundi's New Low-Cost Passive Index Funds. My name is Sean. I'm the head of investments at Endowas. I'm joined by my colleague, Yulin, who is an investment lead at Endowas as well. Uh, before we start, just a bit of administrative um, parts. Uh, Slido, we are running a Slido uh, poll as well. Uh, you can access the link here, https uh, www.sli.do. The code is 789789. Please ask us any questions you have during or after the presentation. And with that, let's kick off the presentation. I'll provide a brief re recap on Anandawas, uh, what we stand for, and how we help clients on their investment journey. We're here to help everyone invest better, to live easier today, and better tomorrow. Our clients are some of our biggest advocates. So thank you for all of those on the call for being a client of Endowas. Endowas is a holistic wealth platform to help investors meet their needs across all funding sources, cash, CPF, and SRS money. We were founded five years ago and continue to grow. We're backed by some of the best strategic partners in the world, some of which are listed on this page, such as SoftBank, Lightspeed, UBS, and Samsung. Locally, EDBI and Singtel. They continue to be very strong strategic partners for our growth as well. Once again, we're a fee-based only advisory platform. Why do clients choose in Dallas? In three words, advice, access, and cost. We are the first uh, and only holistic platform to invest your cash, CPF, and SRS monies, as I mentioned. On the advice portion, we espouse a strategic passive asset allocation to reach your goals. This is scientific-based advice, long-term investments that compound over time. We don't go for tactical trading. We do not recommend timing the markets because we know that doesn't work. On the access point, we provide access to institutional share class of funds. So what the investment office does is curate all the funds of, that are in the universe, up to 6,000 of them, and we choose the best funds and bring these to our clients. Finally, on the cost front, we have no sales charge and no transaction fees. So our, our advice is obviously holistic and aligned with clients. And obviously, we ha have all the investments available to investors in Sing Dollar as well. Just on this page, what you'll see is a snapshot of the fund managers that we work with. So currently, the list is 70 fund managers and growing. You'll recognize most of the names on this page. Uh, they are top tier institutional fund managers. These are typically available to institutional investors at large minimums for the institutional share classes. They manage and aggregate over $20 trillion in assets. We scour these funds to find the best ones available and bring them to our clients. These are the people, um, the leadership team within Endowas. Um, so again, we're all aligned in mission. Uh, and obviously, behind the scenes, uh, everyone on this page is working really hard, and we come from different parts of the world across finance and technology, coming from companies such as Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Blackstone, McKinsey, Amazon, ByteDance, to name a few. Just highlighting a few individuals here, I think you're very familiar. Sam is our CIO and chairman. He was the former CEO and CIO of Morgan Stanley Investment Management in Asia. Greg is our CEO. He's formerly from Grab, where he led the implementation of Grab Payments. And previously to that, he was part of UBS in the investment banking group. We have an extensive range of offerings to meet clients, the wealth needs of different clients. On the top right of the page, you'll see our advised portfolios. These are diversified investment solutions that are built using low cost, best in class fund managers that have gone through a rigorous screening by the investment office. We take the universe of about 6,000 funds. We scour the universe to find the best in class funds. That's about 200 at the moment. This list is growing. We put these into efficient and optimized portfolios. So you'll see there on the top, it ranges from the core portfolios. So again, these are broad diversified asset allocation portfolios of different shapes and sizes. I'll walk through a little bit more about these in a minute. Satellite portfolios, these are for clients who look to express this particular view on the markets. The income portfolio suite and cash smart on the right. At the bottom of the page, you'll see the, see the FundSmart platforms. We think of these as 
individual funds for clients who are looking to make a directed investment into a particular asset class or geographic region, as two examples. Another way to look at our advised portfolios, again, different portfolios to suit your objectives. If you're looking at globally diversified long-term investments, you're looking at the bubble on the top left. So these are the largest aggregate assets that we have. Most clients go into these portfolios. The one that we'll be touching on tonight is the Endowless flagship portfolio. So this one again is diversified asset allocated portfolios um, that are extremely diversified in underlying holdings. They have easily over 10,000 holdings for long-term investors. The income portfolios were launched at the end of last year. These are typically on three different suites. Uh, we have three different income portfolios, typically from kind of a more fixed income oriented passive income to one that has a bit of a tilt towards capital growth as well. Again, clients who are looking to express a particular sectoral, regional, or thematic view go into the Endowa satellite portfolios. And clients who are looking at a bit more short-term horizon, more stability of capital go into the cash smart portfolios. Okay, on to the exciting part of this evening. So right now, uh, we're happy to announce the Endowas flagship portfolio, recommended portfolio change, or RPC as we call it. On this slide, you'll see the focus on the Endowas core flagship portfolios, typically the client's first and most popular choice for long-term investing. We have six different portfolios here constructed to meet the client's risk and return objectives from 100% fixed equity portfolio to 100% fixed income portfolio at 20% increments. Underpinning these allocations is a mix of 10 funds, five equity funds, and five fixed income funds, all of which are best in class, providing globally diversified exposures at extremely low fees. And Dallas has optimized these portfolios to maximize returns for the risk taken across the spectrum of equities to fixed income. You can see the fund list on the right as well, we have tracked the performance over time. These are all available on our website. We're extremely transparent about the information. And we also highlight the geographic mix there as well. I think one thing to highlight as well uh, on the Amundi part, uh, just, just a bit of a teaser, and we'll talk more about this later. Uh, once the Amundi funds are included for CPF investing, this is expected to be around September or October, we'll be conducting an RPC for inclusion into the relevant flagship portfolios as well. Okay, so here we are introducing the lowest cost passive index fund series in Singapore. And Dallas has worked strategically with the Mundi to bring our investors the lowest cost passive index fund series in Singapore. Amundi is the largest European based fund manager and passive index provider when measured by assets under management. Amundi manages over 2 trillion in AUM, which also makes them ranked top 10 globally. The reason I mentioned that large scale is the large scale of Amundi's business allows them to bring efficient economies of scale into the passive investments that they have provided. The table above illustrates the four exclusive um, Amundi funds available on the Endowas platform. The Amundi Index MSCI World Fund, the Amundi Prime USA Fund, the Amundi Index MSCI Emerging Markets Fund, and the Amundi Index Global Aggregate 500 million fund. What you'll find here as you kind of look across the page is they're extremely diversified. So we have there in the second column, the benchmark and description of the index that they track. So extremely efficient at tracking these indices. They do so either by direct physical replication or sampling replication. The market exposures are on the third column. So again, developed markets, US equities, emerging market equities or global fixed income in the broadest way possible. They're also available to endow as clients in Sing Dollar or Sing Dollar Hedge currencies in the case of the fixed income fund. And importantly, they're extremely cost effective. So the range of total expenses we're looking at here are between five basis points and 20 basis points. You can see there on the number of holdings and tracking error, they're extremely uh, vast in their holdings and a very low tracking error as well. It's important to note here that these funds are also available on FundSmart. So we have chosen two of these funds to be included in the flagship portfolios, but clients can go in and buy them individually on FundSmart. Individually, you can construct a basket of them, or you can use them as part of a multi-fund portfolio within FundSmart. If we're looking at drilling down into kind of what are the options, right? We might get asked, uh, what are the options within for Singaporean investors to buy these Amundi funds? I think we just wanted to highlight on this page 
we ran an analysis of the available funds for Singapore investors, both locally and internationally. What we really wanted to highlight here is really it's circled there on kind of the fifth column. So you'll see the total cost. So they're actually the lowest cost for Singapore based investors in Sing dollar, significantly lower than comparable funds that are available within kind of SGX. If you look at it, sometimes international investors or Singapore investors that buy overseas, you can look at there. You can access the ETFs overseas. Those are actually a little more costly as well. And there are obviously currency and other implications to this. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Lynn, to highlight more of the implications of the RPC. Yeah, thanks, Sean, for the introduction. And I think I will just go into a bit more details of the actual um, and specific changes, um, and also to give you some idea of the, the similarities and differences of the current flagship portfolios and the new flagship portfolios that we are um, introducing and actually have introduced. So um, I think it's important to note that um, the introduction of the low cost passive fund options from Amandi that Sean has just introduced really gave us additional room to improve the current flagship portfolio. And um, I believe many of you are already invested in the flagship portfolios here. So you will have received an email pr prompting you to accept the recommended portfolio changes. And if you're new to Indawas and you're considering flagship portfolios, um, then actually the order that you send in uh, would automatically go to the new portfolios that we are talking about right now. So the table summarizes um, the table summarizes the details of the allocation changes for a hundred percent equity allocation and a hundred percent fixed income allocation. Just a quick reminder that our flagship portfolio has a spectrum of asset allocation between equities and fixed income, depending on your risk tolerance. So if say you have a 2080 portfolio based on your risk uh, assessment, you will get a combination of these two portfolios shown here. Uh, and some, some changes to highlight here. So for equities portfolio, we are replacing the Lion Global Infinity US 500 stock index fund with a Monday USA Prime fund, which is currently the lowest cost US index fund available for retail investors in Singapore. And we are also adjusting uh, allocation marginally. And for fixed income portfolio, we added exposure to a Monday index global aggregate 500 mil fund. On the other hand, we are reducing exposure to the PIMCO GIS income fund and dimensional global core fixed income fund. So these changes result in meaningful fee savings across portfolio allocations. Um, for 100% equities portfolio, you see that the cost saving per year is 10 basis point, and the figure is 7 basis point for 100% fixed income portfolio. And I want to emphasize that the changes are by no means tactical and they do not involve any market timing. The portfolios stay efficient and they're focused on long-term wealth accumulation. We expect higher degree of diversification and lower fee for the portfolios to offer better risk adjusted return prospects going forward. Now let's deep dive into the rationales behind portfolio changes. So firstly, for equities portfolio, there is actually a very compelling case for us to use the Amundi Prime USA fund to access the US equities market in, instead, instead of the Lion Global fund. Essentially, the two funds offer very similar exposure to the US equities market, but Amundi fund does it at a much lower cost. Let's take a look at this chart which plus the growth of wealth of S&P 500, which is the index that Lion Global Fund tracks, as well as selective GVS United States Large and Mid Cap Index, uh, which is the index that Amundi Fund tracks. And it also has um, the two target funds that we're talking about here, Lion Global and Amundi. So all of them are actually highly correlated. Um, you see that they are basically moving up and down in the same directions as they're essentially investing in the same markets. But the differential actually really derives from the fee differences. So you see that um, Lion Global has been lagging the S&P index and um, as well as the Monday fund. So Lion Global has been lagging both. And the key reason for that is the fee drag. The higher expense ratio on Lion Global before trailer fee rebates on Indawas, we have a lower net cost for this fund, 
But uh, for comparison purpose, uh, if you buy it, you know, just off from other platform, you get charged about 61 basis point per year. And that is significantly more expensive than the five basis point that among the prime USA fund charges. And over, over time, it compounds to a pretty meaningful differences in um, cumulative performance. Um, and some people might wonder what exactly is the difference between the two indices. Um, indeed, you know, the S&P 500 index is the household name when people think of U.S. large cap stocks. But if we are just thinking about accessing the U.S. equities market from an asset allocation perspective, there are actually other alternative index providers that do similar things at potentially a lower cost. And the selective uh, index is such an example. And Amundi offers access and exposure to the selective index at an extremely low cost. So let's move on. And um, yeah, this is just another chart that shows you the high correlation of the Amundi Prime USA funds to the different US index, um, uh, US equities indices. Uh, and you see that there is a very high correlation also between the Amandi Fund and the Lion Global Fund. So um, another question for curious investors might be the differences in regional and sectoral allocations between the current portfolio and the new portfolio. In summary, the changes to the equities portfolio reduce the portfolio's overweight positions in the United States. There is honestly um, so the, the change is actually pretty incremental and um, the changes or the, the movements on the, to the exposure to other geographies and sectors are really very negligible, as you can see in the comparison table. And I think most importantly, the portfolio continues to be globally diversified, but at a lower cost. So next, um, for the equities portfolio, we can also take a look at performance comparison. A caveat is we all know that past performance is not indicative of future performance. However, analysis and the transparency on historical performance does help to shed some light on the underlying composition changes that we have just done. So it is important to note that both portfolios have achieved outperformance against the benchmark in the recent period, as well as in the long term. And this is a good reminder to investors that the flagship equities portfolios are not entirely passive and just tracking the world equity index. It is a combination of passive and systematic active funds to be core yet value adding. The exposure of the portfolio to proven vectors of return, such as value and quality through dimensional funds, has actually clearly paid off for long term investors. And another thing you might notice is the slightly higher returns for the new portfolio versus the current portfolio. But in the recent period, the new portfolio has led current portfolio slightly. I don't want us to read too much into this. Um, but I think uh, at least there is some kind of evidence in the historical data in the improvement in long term result um, because of the lower cost. And the short term deviation of performance between the two is really driven by the very, very small composition differences between the two underlying indices, S&P 500 and Selective. And the main driver is really because of uh, the 1% overweight in technology stocks in Selective versus S&P 500. But in the long term, we have looked at the data and we are very assured that the two indices actually track each other very closely. And over the last 15 year period, the performance differential between the two is like five basis point annualized with actually selective outperforming S&P 500 slightly. So now let's switch gear to fixed income allocation. On a sector basis, the portfolio has reduced its underweight to government bonds while trimming its overweight allocation to corporate and securitized bonds. And geographically, country allocation have moved um, closer to benchmark. So because of this, we expect the new portfolio to have a reduced long term tracking arrow against the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Bond Index, which is the benchmark. Um, and there are two underlying reasons for such allocation changes. So firstly, to further diversify our portfolio. 
The current portfolio is already very robust, but it does have a fair bit of credit beta compared to the benchmark. And adding government bonds will diversify the return profile to have more rates exposure. And the second motivation of allocation changes is really to make the portfolio more core, to have um, closer tracking, um, but still active um, kind of um, exposure to the market um, so that the, the longer term performance is more anchored to um, what the market is offering. And to be clear, the portfolio as a whole remains largely allocated to actively managed funds. As you can see, it's primarily PIMCO and plus uh, some dimensional and plus the amount the passive fund. Uh, we still believe that there is room for active management in fixed income investing, given the inherent inefficiencies of bond markets. So next, for the performance comparison between the current portfolio and the new portfolio, um, the portfolio changes have brought down the portfolio risk level, understandably due to more diversification and allocation to government bonds. The lower risk is com commensurate with the lower return profile in the past decade, when the fixed income market rolled a bull run, benefiting higher risk strategies. The flip side of this is that in the recent period of market drawdown, the portfolio, the new portfolio is actually slightly more defensive on the downside. And finally, the active nature of the portfolio means that the portfolio will still deviate from benchmark quite meaningfully from time to time. But in the long term, it has outperformed the benchmark. And in recent period, it has unfortunately underperformed because of its overweight to credit US and emerging markets compared to the benchmark. So that wraps up the section on um, recommended portfolio changes. Um, and Let's switch gear to kind of walk you through operationally how it works and how can you go in and opt in for the new flagship portfolios. So um, maybe we go to the next slide. Yeah, next one. Yeah, so there are two ways essentially um, to access the recommended portfolio changes pages. If you go onto your Indala's website and log into your page, um, you can see the notifications on the top right corner of the page. And if you just click on that, you will see that the recommended portfolio change notification would be there for you. And if you click on the few recommendations, uh, you can see all the details of the portfolio changes on the before and after and the fee comparison, the composition comparison, et cetera, before you go and accept it. Um, another way to access it is actually to go to the goal page, the, your relevant goal page. Say I have a goal set up for flagship 6040. And once you have clicked on it, you can go to goal settings. Again, on the top right hand side of the, um, of, of the page. Um, and you can view recommended changes, which will basically bring you to the same few recommendations um, display. So this is how it would look like, essentially after you have clicked on the few recommendations tab. Um, you see, we have listed all the kind of the, the, the line by line um, weightage change to your portfolio. And it's different for everyone because your portfolios, depending on whether it has been rebalanced before, um, it could have slightly different compositions as the market has drifted. Um, but we will bring it back um, to the target allocation during RPCS, uh, during the recommended portfolio change um, as well. So this is the step of exactly, you know, how um, how the the trades would actually be treated and um, uh, submitted and um, executed. So firstly, we will only redeem the funds which are no longer part of the portfolio, and then we will invest the proceeds into the new funds to align your portfolio to the updated target asset allocation. So an important point to note is that actually you will only the that part of the money that's redeemed will only be out of the market, meaning not invested in the market for one day only. So once the sell order is confirmed, which is about two days after 
um, the, the, the submission of the trades. The next day, we will immediately put in the buy order. So the, the, the friction is really minimized through this process. Um, and I think any concern on kind of being out of the market for too long, especially in this volatile period, um, can be addressed through, through this point. Uh, we understand the concern, but really it is just, you know, a portion of your portfolio taken out of the market for only one day. And the second thing is we will actually take this opportunity to rebalance your portfolio. So this is a service that we provide to our clients by auto rebalancing any drifts in your portfolio allocation to the target asset allocation. And overall, from the beginning to the end, it will approximately take seven to 10 business days to complete. Um, but again, as we have just mentioned, the time that you're actually out of the market is only one day. So with this, um, let me give back to Sean to conclude. Thank you, Yulin. I think I'll just highlight, emphasize a couple points. I think these are coming up in the Q&A as well. So the overarching reason for initiating the change uh, and in Dallas, we're always striving to enhance our flagship portfolios. So in this exercise, we've further improved the diversification of the underlying flagship portfolios. We've brought these portfolios further in line with the core asset allocation. Another key factor as well was lowering the already low fees on core flagship. Again, these are about seven to 10 basis points in difference. We look at this slide right now, just wanted to provide a, a quick recap on where we are in the markets today. So I think a lot of you that have followed our webinars will, will be very familiar with this table. From the start of the year until the current um, <clears throat> 12 August, what you'll see is most asset classes are still underwater for the year. Commodities still remains above water. It is probably the only asset class that is above for the year. It's up 26% and it's been pretty volatile in the last couple months. Uh, bonds are down, they've recovered slightly. So the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Index is down 7.4%. Equities, as represented by the MSCI All Country World Index, is down 11.5%, and Bitcoin is down significantly more at 47% down. If you look at kind of uh, this slide over here, uh, what you'll see is uh, we take a step back and look at a longer term picture. So this is a 21 year chart from 1st January 2001 till the end of July. Uh, if you have three different portfolios, so a pure equity portfolio is represented by the blue line, the equity performance. The green line is the Bloomberg Global Aggregate bond performance and a 60-40 portfolio. So obviously what you'll notice is markets are up and right sloping, so they have actually been in positive performance over time. The second thing to note is obviously the ebb and flow in different periods. So in early 2000, you, you had the dot-com crisis. In 2008, the great financial crisis. There were some smaller sell-offs in between that time, such as 2016 with the elections. And in 2018 and in 2020, there was obviously the COVID sell-off. And then the recent period on the right, you'll see that there's been a pretty sharp sell-off, both in equities and fixed income. Uh, that's in the gray on the right. And what you'll see it as well is, uh, interestingly, a balanced portfolio, so we're just putting a 60% equity, 40% fixed income portfolio here, has smoothened out these stream of returns. Interestingly as well, a 60-40 portfolio over the last 21 years has been close to in line with a pure equity portfolio with much lower volatility. And part of the reason for that is on the next slide, which you'll see here, it's diversification. So this is a scatter plot. We've used this before as well. A scatter plot of fixed income returns and equity returns on a calendar year basis. So if we were to look at on every single calendar year, where the equities end up and where the fixed income end up for the year. In most years, uh, you'll actually see them at the top right, meaning equities were up somewhat and fixed income was also up. And then a lot of times when they're in the top left, a bottom right, in the top left, this is where equities are up and bonds are down. And in the bottom right, these are where bonds are up and equities are down. So obviously these are the years where fixed income equity do provide diversification. And that's why one is up and the other is down. In 2022, it's particularly painful for clients because through June this year, both equities and fixed income are down. But obviously this speaks to the benefits of diversification in most years. We illustrate this another, another way, which is on the next slide. So what you'll see here is bar charts. So we have three different charts uh, lines here, similar to uh, the earlier slide where the blue bars are pure equities as, as represented by the MSCI All Country World. The green line is the global bond index. So this is again, the Barclays, the Bloomberg Global Ag. 
and a 60% equity, 40% fixing on portfolio. So what we've charted here as well as the range of returns over one year. So if you bought into equities for a year over there, this is the three bars on the left. You could have been up 46% to down 43%. In bonds, you could have been down 9% or up 11%. So this is the range of returns. So if you had a portfolio of 60% equity, 40% bonds, you'd be somewhere between 29% to down 28%. So what I'd like to note here is if you kind of look at a five or 10 year rolling period, you actually see that the range of returns actually grows kind of tighter. So obviously two things, you wanna be more diversified because you can see there on the right, a 10 year rolling for a 60, 40 portfolio, not saying everyone should have a 60, 40 portfolio, but having bonds and equities in the mix typically helps you kind of smoothen the range of returns and actually it's a bit more positive as well. So again, the certainty of returns are much higher being diversified and staying in for the long term definitely makes sense. Okay, final final slide on, on the kind of staying invested. Uh, I think the title says it pretty clearly. Don't try to time the market. Um, we cannot beat the market. So if you bought a thousand, put a thousand dollars into the market over the last twenty four years, nineteen ninety seven to twenty twenty one, your thousand dollars staying purely invested into the markets, you would have had made ten thousand dollars or ten times your return. If you missed a couple days, if you missed a couple weeks, you missed a couple months, you would have actually missed out on a significant portion of those returns. And another thing to add is obviously, and where the markets actually do bottom, no one knows when this is, the inflections between the bottoms are typically the sharpest. So the markets do rally sharpest off the bottom and no one's able to time this. At Endowis, we believe there are eight principles. Uh, I'll just go through these really quickly. So again, maximize returns by minimizing costs. I think that's one of the reasons we're going through this entire RPC exercise. Cost is a very clear drive in the portfolio and Dallas portfolios are already extremely cost efficient. We access only institutional clean share classes. If we take trailers, we'll pass them back to the clients. Extremely low fare fees. So we, we've further done that, that within this exercise. Number two, we believe in the power of the markets. These compound markets compound over time. You just need to stay invested. Number three, time in the markets. Do not time the markets. Number four, intelligent asset allocation. So what we encourage investors to do, again, goals-based portfolios, define what your risk tolerance is. We've done a lot of work into trying to optimize all our portfolios. We try and pick the best funds and we optimize portfolios for every incremental risk that you take to have the best return. Again, that's number five, strive for the efficient frontier. Number six, it speaks to the same thing. We believe in diversification because as I shared earlier, having kind of assets that are not correlated to each other or less correlated to each other actually improves return over time. Your personal risk tolerance, everyone has different goals and objectives with their investments. So obviously we have created portfolios to achieve what clients define as their objectives. Know your limitations. We do not create any products. We just simply look for the best funds in the universe. And there's a 10 man team focused on doing this. Okay, we want to wrap it up with this slide here. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we take a scientific based approach to meeting clients long term wealth goals, not short term, not tactical. We are not market timing. Often we, we espouse what we call an SPAA or strategic passive asset allocation. I just wanted to spend a minute to describe this a little more. So from the top down, it's strategic meaning long-term in nature, I think five, seven, 10 years. Passive meaning the asset allocation is defined when a client defines a risk tolerance should be passive in nature. So fairly static in terms of overall asset allocation. This does not mean the allocation actually does not shift. So from a bottom up basis, what we do is we populate these allocations with the best funds that we can find on the market. So best strategies, best in class managers, what we do with the lowest cost, we evaluate these holistically and then we put them into a client's portfolio on that efficient frontier. So in this case, as Yulin did highlight and I've highlighted as well, what we're doing here is bringing costs down. We're bringing the portfolios more in line with a core diversified asset allocation because these are likely to improve risk adjusted returns over time. Um, invest better to live better. So thank you again for all your support and staying invested within Dallas. We hope to be on the journey with you going forward. And with that, we can open it up for some Q&A. Yeah, uh, I can start with a few questions. So the top voted question is on tax treatment on US dividends for the Amandi funds. Um, the answer is that 
It really depends. So the treatment on US dividends depends on the fund domicile and its structure. Um, so the only, uh, I guess, preferential tax treatment you can get for US dividends is through an Irish domicile ETF. So instead of 30%, you will be able to get 15%. But um, the Irish domicile ETF cannot be made available for CPF. Um, and this is why um, the Amandi fund, uh, if we want to get it to CPF, it's still the best option. Uh, and it, it will just be the standard 30% withholding tax. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a question here. I can take this one. Uh, what kind of replication and, and how is the tracking error? So maybe we can go back to, I think it's slide 13. Um, so here, what, what we've highlighted is, is we've kind of put it on a table and obviously reach out to your client advisor if you have any further questions. What we're tracking here is the replication that we use. So that's on the right column. It's either direct or sampling replication. But as far as the investment office is concerned, you know, it's we're not we're agnostic really to how Amundi does it. So first thing we know is the premise is Amundi is a very large, Europe's largest uh, base fund manager and a very, very well established manager in the passive space. So they have teams that are able to efficiently track the indices that they're trying to track via direct or sampling replication. In the case of, you know, there was a question on the Bloomberg Global Ag 500. So that's $500 million size issues and up for the Bloomberg Global Ag. It is sampling replication. However, that being said, they have close to 6,000 holdings. Another way we look at it is tracking error. So the three-year tracking error is 20 basis points, extremely close to the benchmark. And the total expense, again, all in on a NAV basis, it's 10 basis points. So extremely efficient at tracking, extremely diversified as well. Yeah, maybe I can just add on to that. Um, so I think the question also mentioned synthetic replication, which is replicating using derivatives. Um, so now of the Monty funds currently uses synthetic replication, even the sample replication is buying physical bonds. It's just it doesn't buy the whole universe. Um, it will break down into sections, you know, the representing key risk factors like duration, currency, country, maturity, rating and sector. And then the Amandi team will pick the bonds included in the index to mimic the risk profile of each section. This is why you can see such a closer tracking and still a very diversified portfolio of like 6,000 holdings. Okay, um, there's, a, there's another question here. Oh, I think the easy one is when will these be available in CPF for investment? Uh, so we ex expect these Amundi funds to be included in CPF for investments, likely in September and October. So we obviously will make these available on the FundSmart platform. And also, obviously, we, we, will, we will inform clients and we will be doing RPC for our portfolios. Yeah, um, I think there's a question. Yeah, the second popular question is on whether this fund is uh, distributing dividend or accumulating. It's accumulating. Um, I think you are looking at a different icing for the Amandi USA fund. Um, that's the DR should be after the usage ETF. So if you just go search for the exact icing that's included in this portfolio, I think it's the identifier for the fund, um, then you should be able to see AS at the end of the fund name and that's accumulating. Yep, exactly. I think I just added on your list point. So what we're showing is this total returns of the, so it's everything will be in the now. So to the extent there are dividends received by the underlying, so many receiving dividends and underlying holdings, they will reinvest that and that will be obviously priced by their committee into the NAV on a daily basis. Just scrolling through. Yeah, I think we've addressed the uh, time gap. So I think just to reiterate, right now um, you will be, investors are out of the investment for the to the extent that we are making the change, which will be for two funds. Uh, for a one day gap for the extent that we're making changes to particular funds. Yeah, um, the question on the AUM and trading volume of Amandi Prime USA versus Lion Global and how this would impact the liquidity and closing positions. So um, I think, yes, you know, trading volume is very, very crucial if you look at uh, exchange traded ETF. But actually, for both the Monday and Line Global, they are in a fund structure, meaning that it will 
close at the end of the NAV, net asset value of the underlying securities, and it will not have any bid ask spread um, based on the trading and liquidity condition. Um, so I think the only, yeah, and uh, basically when you know you buy the units of the fund, um, it will just go and buy all the underlying securities for you. Um, and the US market, equities market is a very liquid market. So it should be able to do so at a very, very low transaction cost. And that will be taken into account in the, um, the, the expense ratio anyway. So don't need to worry about that. OK, then there is a question here on active versus passive, particularly within fixed income. So I think we are still proponents of active management within fixed income. Um, obviously, that has shown to be accretive to returns over time. So what we're doing here is not moving from a completely active portfolio to a completely passive portfolio. What we're doing is we're recalibrating the portfolio slightly, as Yulin mentioned. We're bringing down, broadly speaking, kind of government, uh, corporate exposure, increasing government exposure, and increasing the location of the underlying holdings. And obviously, costs do come down as well. So this is kind of that holistic view, the few points that we're making here. And with that, we believe this will obviously be a bit more balanced, diversified, and hence potential to outperform over time. So we're not actually switching completely from active to passive. We're just moving a bit more core. Mm. Yeah, um, there's a question on, from Harry. Would switching to a Monday US Prime fund increase tracking error since it tracks the selective instead of S&P 500 like Lion Global? I think, um, firstly, just uh, in terms of tracking, um, both funds, they track different indices. But I guess what you are really trying to ask is what the US, um, the Monday US Prime fund track S&P 500. Um, well, and would that be increased tracking our against S&P 500? I think the way to look at it is when we do our portfolio construction and think about asset allocation, we think about building blocks like U.S. equities, emerging markets equities, and how do we get exposure to these building blocks, to these liquid markets um, at a low cost? So um, to get access to these um, markets, passively you can you know basically choose the different indices that represent the performance of the markets but s p 500 is one of the indices that's I, I i think that just happens to be a household name and it's been there um, for a very long time so everyone knows about it and because it has performed really well for the past 10 years right so um when people now think about u.s equities they immediately relate like to S&P 500. But actually there are some other indices out there that also provide exposure to the US equities markets. Sure, um, the exact construction methodology in terms of how they combine and weight the underlying companies within that basket of companies that they track performance might be slightly different. But if you look at the long-term performance, they are very, very similar to each other. So I think then the question becomes, how can I get exposure to the US equities market, regardless of what indices, what underlying indices um, that represents it at a low cost and as much, um, as much as possible. And this brings us to among the USA prime. Um, we think that it's the cost structure is just really very attractive, five basis point to access the US large cap equities market. Yeah, and, and I hope that addresses your questions as well. Yeah, thank you. And then I think I would just emphasize that, you know, when we look at, say, side 17, you'll see there actually the correlation between S&P 500 and, and the sole active and obviously the Mundi Prime USA fund is extremely, extremely high. And as Yulin mentioned, you know, we did an analysis of the tracking error performance over the long term. It's really within basis points. So again, extremely efficient. So it's really focusing on cost and efficiency of tracking uh, the broad US equity market. I think there was a, there's a question on cost um, difference between the two. So Amundi is a five base, Amundi Prime USA is a five basis point. The Lion Global Infinity uh, US 500 is a 61 basis point expense. Uh, yeah. 
Um, but that's before mm -hmm. the trailer fees that yep. you can get back. So the gross net, the gross expense ratio is 61 basis point. But on dollars, you get additional 28 20, basis points. 7.5 yep. basis points. <laughs> <laughs> so the net cost of um, accessing this bond is um, 33.5 basis points. Yep. dollars. There is a question on why, um, where is it? The uh, emerging markets allocation. Why do we not replace dimensional EM fund with um, the, the, the Amondi one? Um, I think firstly, um, Sean, feel free to add on. Um, just, just bottom line to look at the fee difference. It's not as big as the differences in fees between um, between Line Global and Amondi. And I think secondly, when we do the portfolio, we don't want it to be like a completely passive portfolio. Um, we still want to have moderate exposure to different factors, um, like you know, value, quality, and those are what dimensional funds can provide us with. And we do believe that they will, it will work long term. Um, so I think the considering holistically kind of diversification of return sources, which is market data as well as the different factors, and also the, the extent of um, fee saving, we decided not to do this change. Exactly. Thank you. And I would, yeah, I would just add, it's essentially that um, it's a holistic process. So it's not, not just on the fees, it's again, the tracking. And again, for this, for this round, we, we really wanted to just make the portfolios more efficient. Uh, it's something we are evaluating and not, not uh, for this round of RPC. Okay. Thanks for the shout out. <laughs> Change your Lion Global to Amandi because it's so cheap. <laughs> Okay, um, I think there's a question here that's getting some upvotes on in, even with the Amundi low fee, it is still relatively more costly than the S&P 500 index ETF. Um, I think I think relatively more costly and five basis points is a pretty it's a pretty low cost. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the next thing is obviously there are implications on buying an S&P 500 index ETF. If you're buying an ETF on a US exchange, you are subject to bid ask. I know it's fairly tight, but you are subject to that. You are also subject to buying it in US dollars. So again, you know, for Singapore-based retail investors in Sing Dollar, um, I think the Amundi is a is a good choice. I'm not saying that that you know it is the only choice. So it is up to investors for their own situations to make that evaluation. Mm, there are some operational questions. Um, if I am on 100% line global S&P 500, can I make the switch? You can do a gold modification, I believe. Yeah. Okay, I think we've caught most of it. Um, maybe just in closing uh, on slide 37. So again, uh, first, I just want to thank uh, everyone for attending this evening's session. I hopefully it was helpful. Again, very excited to partner with Amundi on an exclusive basis to launch these four Amundi passive index funds, two of which are included in this, this uh, recommended portfolio change exercise. Uh, so again, clients that have opted in uh, will we'll obviously go through the change exercise. All clients that are putting new monies to work within our flagship portfolios will be into the new structure of these portfolios. Encourage you to reach out to our uh, client advisors should you have any questions on Endowas. So again, you can scan the QR code here or and register to link to schedule a session to speak with our advisors. And again, we're always here to help. Thank you all for the support uh, and have a good evening.